Hello students, we have been covering a lot of the tools that witches use and if you're taking my Wiccan class you probably have heard about some of these. But today we wanted to go a little bit deeper into them for those of you that um, have never had experience with them or never heard of them or you just have a basic understanding. So carpenters, of course, use hammers saws and screwdrivers and lots of other tools in their work. Chefs use knives and spoons and bowls and pots and pans. So what do spell workers use? Well, technically speaking, you don't need anything except your mind to cast a spell. However, people who do magic generally use certain tools and what we call accoutrement in part because these help you focus and therefore achieve greater success with your spells. The tools you use to do magic speak to your subconscious mind. The tool's shape, material, and other features provide clues to its symbolism and its role in a spell's work according to the concept of sympathetic magic that we explained before. In this module, we're going to look at some of the most popular tools, witches, wizards, and other spell workers use, and the roles these implements play in spells. Remember, however, that even the most elegant tool requires your will to empower it. You might decide to work with a few of these, all or none, but it's up to you entirely. Now, before we get into the tools, I wanted to talk and touch a little bit about talking about masculine and feminine energies. So when we speak of masculine and feminine energies, we don't mean men and women. Instead, we are referring to the complementary forces that exist everywhere in our universe, action masculine and receptivity feminine. You'll notice that spellcaster tools correspond to the human body, symbolically depicting those energies. The wand and the athem, which represent masculine power, look distinctly phallic. The chalice and the cauldron signify femininity energy and the womb. The five rays of the pentagram stand for the five points of the body, the head, the arms, and the legs. Now let's talk about my favorite tool, the wand. You're familiar with magic ones, no doubt. The fairy tales we love as children told us that you could tap a guy on the head with a magic wand and turn him into a frog or make him disappear. That's not the, re the reason spell workers use wands, though. A wand's real purpose is to direct energy. You can either attract or send energy with your wand. Aim it at the heavens to draw down cosmic power pointed toward a person, place, or theme to protect and project energy towards your goal. Some magicians cut circles with their wands. Choosing your wand. What material makes the best wand? Well, traditionally, magicians use wood for the wands, particularly willow, yew, hazel, or rowan, but you don't have to hold with tradition. If you prefer, select the one fabricated from metal, glass, quartz, ceramic, or whatever cost to you. If you decide that you want a wooden one and plan to cut a small branch from a tree, always ask the tree's permission first and thank it when you finish. Cutting a wand is a ritual in itself, so approach the task with the proper mindset. Your wand should be at least six inches long, but no longer or heavier than you will find comfortable to handle. Are you a down-to-basics kind of person? If so, you may want to leave your wand in its natural state. Will you enjoy something more ornate, like the one in the picture, for example? Then decorate your wand to suit your fancy. Again, the choice is yours, however, because the wand is considered a fire tool, you might like to enhance its fiery nature with appropriate adornments such as, like you can see here, red, orange, or gold paint, 
gold brass or iron accents, red or orange gemstones, garnet, ruby, carnelian, or so red jasper. You can also create astrological glyphs from the fire signs such as Aries, Leo or Sagittarius or red or orange ribbons, feathers and beadwork. Now, it is important, of course, to choose your wand, but it is more important to charge your wand. Now it's time to infuse your wand with magical power. This transforms it from a stick of wood or a metal rod into an awesome tool for spell work, which is wizards and other magicians often enact a ritual or ceremony to charge their tools. It can be as simple or elaborate as you wish, your intention and attitude are the most important factors. For example, part of your wand might involve uh, hanging the wand from a tree in a sunshine for a solar month. Because charging your wand is a magical act, approach the ritual with the proper mindset and perform within a circle. So you may consider one of the following techniques. Hold your wand in the smoke of a ritual fire. You can anoint your wand with essential oils like cinnamon, sandalwood, clove, or mask. You can carve it with words or symbols of power. You can chant an incantation you compose for this purpose, or you play. You can also play energizing music. Clearly and with authority, instruct your wand to do your bidding. Command it to work with you and only you. Point it towards the south and invite the energy of fire to enter it. Breathe your own energy into the one to bring it to life, and when you're finished, stay out loud. So mote it be. We all know about the magic ones at Howard's. What woods make the best magic ones? Well, according to the author J.K. Rowling, Harry Potter's first wand is made of from holly, while Hermione Granger's is made from wine wood. Ron Weasley's first wand is fashioned from ash, and Draco Malfoy's from Hathorn. Of course, we all know about the lore and evil Voldemort. Those who, or that who might not be named, choose you for his wand, a wood the magicians link with longevity, but that also has associations with death. These suggestions are just that, suggestions. The best and most powerful charging rituals are those that you design yourself.